Do Peros y Tu Peras, today on Do By The River. Ladies and gentlemen, the Casper sale has been official. He's off to Chicago. We'll talk We'll talk about our thoughts on that move. Of course, with Casper leaving, that means someone else has to come in. Mikel Ore, is it going to happen this week, Philadelphia? We're going to talk about that, as well as the Union are restocking even for more on the striker position. We got a homegrown signing. We got a lot to get to here today, and you do not want to miss this episode of Do By The River. And let's get started, guys. Hey! Stop. And that is right. Welcome, everyone, to Do By The River, the show where we follow everything Philadelphia Union. And, of course, we are brought to you by Philly Sports Network. Before we dive in today, ladies and gentlemen, real quick, make sure you guys hit that like button and subscribe as we broadcast every single week on Edipop Snowflake's YouTube channel. And make sure to find us on PSN Radio, wherever you stream podcasts, on Apple, Google, and Spotify. And you can find all of your favorite Philly Sports Network podcasts on there as well. Ladies and gentlemen, no, we do not have Justin. No, we do not have Tim or Zach. They are taking it off this week. So today, we got some great super subs. Not one, but two El Seniors coming on here, ladies and gentlemen. So let's introduce them here today. First up, we got my man, Mr. Don Chris from Mr. All. We, I like the name there, Mr. All Three Points. I love it. What's up? Yeah. Yo, it's great to be here. I, I like the, the hype music at the beginning, too. I was dancing. I'm glad the mic was off. I'm glad the camera was off because I was feeling it. That's what we try to do here, Chris. We, we try to keep the, the vibes going. We try to keep keep up positive. Because, you know, here, not just with the Union, but in Philly sports, it can be dark sometimes. Ooh. The Union's been great, though. So uh, we'll always keep those energies alive, man, for sure. Thank you for coming on, Chris. It's good to be here. Absolutely, man. And then, of course, this man needs no no introduction here in, Phil, in the Philadelphia Union community. But please, ladies and gentlemen, from the brotherly game, please welcome Mr. Matt Ralph. Matt. It is so good talking to you, buddy. How you doing, man? Good. It's great to be here. This is uh, it's kind of like the Dad Rock episode with Chris on here. <laughs> That's I'm cold. Man. Instead, instead of playing in a garage band right now, uh, Chris and I are on a podcast. So. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, Hey, listen, I'm, anything to keep the fan base young, for sure, man. I'm, I'm here for that. I'm definitely here for that. But, uh, um, yeah, so, guys, real quick before we start off, um, you know, if for the for those who are not familiar with you guys, you know, kind of a little bit of an introduction. Uh, Chris, for yourself, man, kind of, you know, talk talk about how you who you are and especially, um, you know, your fandom as a Philadelphia, member of the, uh, the fan base of the Philadelphia Union and kind of a little bit of all three points. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, my name is Chris. I, I run the All Three Points podcast and the All Three Points Twitter uh, I'm a writer and assistant editor for the Philly Soccer page, which has been around since 2008, 2009, writing about local soccer. You OGs. Know, and, well, yeah, in terms of my fan OGs, I definitely had a jersey before there was a team. Uh, but, you know, I like the idea that we could be the old heads and still have people that might see their first game tomorrow or encounter the union like the first time on this show. So I like to find the middle ground to all that. But it's really good to be here. Absolutely, man. I, I appreciate, uh, you know, especially all those people who've been covering the team since even before, you know, the hype of leading up to 2010. I, I have the utmost respect for all those people, especially some Sons of Ben members as well, man. It's it's always dope to have uh, people like you've seen it because obviously for myself, I was I was still a young buck in those days. So I really didn't have like the I, I wasn't like grasping it all like I, I do now. So definitely appreciate guys like you. Uh, listen, man, I, I'm so, I was Sons of Ben member 107, but I don't get I'm not taking any credit for that group because there's people that spent half their Amen. life making that thing what it is, and so you know Amen. I got a lot of respect for them too. Absolutely, absolutely, and of course, Matt, you don't need much introduction, but uh, you know, kind of talk about uh, you know just just your involvement with Brotherly Game and, and uh, you know kind of talk about a little bit about Brotherly Game as well. Yeah, so I mean, my I guess my OG credentials would be that I. Uh, in 2007, I was covering higher education in South Jersey, and you'd never think that covering higher education, you'd end up writing about MLS, but that's what happened uh, when MLS announced that they were going to try to put a stadium in Glassboro. Actually, well, you don't want to, you don't want me to get technical about it. Not actually Glassboro, <laughs> near Glassboro uh, uh, on some land that some peach farms that uh, Rowan University had purchased at the time. But uh, that was my introduction really to the team that would become the Philadelphia Union. Uh, I got my first emails after writing some stories from some people that uh, who were part of the this this crazy supporters group that started forming around just this idea of 
you know, obviously that didn't work out and it's, it's a good thing it didn't, but um, I mean, I could you imagine going, Johnny, could you imagine going to Glassboro or Harrison Township to go to a soccer game right now? But um, I mean, I would actually like that map because actually, I actually like it, live but... in Glassboro <laughs> yeah, right now. I know, I know, but like this, <laughs> like how weird game. that would be, you know? Yeah. Um, no, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. And uh, so, you know, so and then I, I kind of moved out of the area, so I was never, I, you know, I wrote about it, but I then I kind of left and and uh, you know was came back to Lancaster and funnily, funnily, uh, oddly enough, my first game at. Uh, yeah, Subaru Park was a U.S. men's national team game against Columbia. Nice. Hey. Um, were you there at that one time? I was not, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and so, and then kind of like through that, you know, and then when I moved back to the area, that's when I, uh, you know, I happened to live like 10 minutes from the stadium. So got kind of c- connected to that. And then Casa, which probably a lot of people you talk to, like that's been their connection to all this is probably through, through playing with Casa. And uh, I know Chris has done a lot of that too. Um, and then just got roped in, you know, you know, if you're gonna play on a Casa team, like don't let on that you write or or do anything <laughs> with content because you get you get roped into to doing stuff, and that's kind of what happened. And then, you know, ended up doing you know some different things. And then uh, it, it, for me, it's kind of been my way of uh, still doing this journalism thing, and um, you know, kind of scratching that itch uh, into my into my 40s now. So it's, it's been it's been fun. No, it's awesome. I appreciate everything um, you do. And obviously, we'll talk about the article you put out today as well a little bit later. But you guys do a great job over Brotherly Game, not even just the writing team. But obviously, we, we're big fans of the Doopy Brothers as well. They're, they're doing a great job as well. So keep, for both of you guys, keep up the good work for sure. Yeah, maybe that's my claim to fame is that I get randomly mentioned on Doopy Brothers episodes. But, uh, <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say that you discovered the Doopy Brothers. I would give you credit for that. <laughs> Yeah, those guys are great. I, I love AJ and, and Luke. Yeah, they're, they're awesome. They're good. They're pretty hilarious. Pretty hilarious. Well, gentlemen, we have a lot to get to with this team. You guys ready to start start chopping this up? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's get to it. So, of course, uh, we should probably start off with the news that's already been long overdue. Um, on Saturday morning, um, as I'm waking up bright and early to do my Sixers recap, I get this beautiful notification that the Union have uh, sent Casper uh, Shabilko to the Chicago Fire uh, for one point fifteen million dollars in general allocation money, be spread out through these next two seasons. And um, I'm not gonna lie, to you, but I'll, I'll tell you first off, as the fan, I was a little bit sentimental. You know, I, I thought this was the right move, but then I took a second and I thought about the time here, Casper. Man, Casper was such a great dude, and obviously he's gonna be so important, you know, going forward, especially in our history. I mean, he almost broke the single season record. He almost broke the all time record in goals as well. Um, and it's going to be sad to see him go, but I'm, I'm happy for him. Uh, he seems like he's, I know he's going to enjoy Chicago, but first off, uh, but I, I kind of want to get your guys' thoughts and, uh, we'll start with Chris here. Uh, Chris, your thoughts on, you know, Casper leaving and the move in general. I, I think I felt the same way you did. It, it was, I, I tweeted two weeks ago that, that in 12 months time, Casper Shabilko was going to be the union's all time scoring leader. Cause I, I genuinely felt if they kept him around. He'd bang 17 more and that would be it. Um, and I was, I, I, even though I had read the reports and I heard the rumors, I was genuinely surprised it all came together. Um, in the end, it kind of sounded like they just couldn't meet in the middle, but it sort of reminds me a little bit about um, when Sebastian Latou was traded the second time. Uh, it was like right, like the month Ernie Stewart got here, I think he traded Latou. And I said to Jeremy on our show, yeah, I guess I, I guess so. Like he want, Ernie wants to put his mark on the team. The two isn't quite fitting with this team right now. Um, so it kind of reminded me a little bit of that. But I'm I'm honest. If I'm honest with you, I think if they I think they could have made it work. And I think Union fans will will genuinely uh, reflect his his career will be reflected better the more time we get from it because I think people don't realize just how important he was to the last three seasons. No, you're 100 percent right, and I agree with you there. You need it because obviously when Ernst got here, right, you need to define those pieces of play. And they probably weren't going to be, you know, here long term. But you needed to find those pieces of players that were going to be part of this transition of what we're seeing now, this winning culture. We're an elite club in the MLS, which is wild to kind of say still to this day. Uh, Matt, you're you're, you're kind of takeaways on this Casper deal. Yeah, so it's interesting, you know, as you just were saying that, you know, Casper is to – Ernst Tanner, kind of what Alejandro Bedoya was to Ernie, mm. um, in the sense that, you know, it wasn't a big deal when he signed him, but he turned into a, a it turned into a big deal. And I think, 
you know, in the same way that Bedoya kind of bought into this idea that like, hey, that the, the, we can build a team around you here and you can win something. Um, because, you know, Bedoya hadn't played in MLS before, you know, he had been successful in Europe and, you know, it took some convincing to get him to buy into this. And I think at, at one point there was some talk, bef- you know, a year before he actually ended up coming. So, you know, it was something they had worked on for a while with him and, and they really have built the team around him. And, and, and so, and, and a lot of the success has been as a result of the, the, the chance that Bedoya took, right. Um, with Casper, it was more of the chance that, you know, the union took on him to say, Hey, you know, we have this, you know, we have this great uh, performance staff uh, shout out to Garrison Draper um, who, um, you know, brought in this guy that they, they weren't sure what they had, but they were able to, to get him back to full health. And I mean, it's amazing. If you look at his, his injury history and see what did he miss that NYC game that time where he was a late scratch and one I mean, play playoff game when he had a, a foot thing yeah, two years ago. Yeah. What, what yeah I, yeah and, he, and the, yeah he missed the nyc game and then he missed the i guess that would have been the red bull game after that mm-hmm. Game. Mm-hmm. uh so okay so three seasons and that's that's all we can remember um as far as i mean i don't you know i don't have data on this but if you look across the league in terms of players you know, at that position who have been that consistently in the lineup and available every game yes he was overworked last year because of necessity and i think that probably led to some of the, you know, the less than stellar outings that he had toward the end of the season. Uh, also because he's, you know, Crystal can get into that tactical side of things, right. In terms of him not being as effective as a, as a solo striker in a, in a Christmas tree. Yeah. But you know, the consistency that he did produce, was he frustrating at times? Yes. Was he, was there, uh, was he the greatest striker, you know, in MLS history? No. Uh, but I think he, his, you know, the ability, him being able to kind of come in and sort of help to to sort of push through this new era, like you said, Johnny, you nailed it. Like he was the guy, and you know, if 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 MLS was more like MLB, Casper uh, would be would be would have would have gotten a huge contract offer to stay, um, and then maybe ultimately went to Chicago anyway. But because you know, soccer rewards uh, future performance more than past performance. Um, you know, it, it was a situation where, you know, Chicago obviously is willing to to, 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 to put the investment in. And, it, you know, I think it was a, I think it's a, a great move for both teams. Uh, you know, I, I'm a Chicago Cubs fan. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm a little bit, you know, Gobbies. you know, I've never liked the Chicago Fire. I saw them play when I lived in Chicago for a little bit. But you know, now they've rebranded and I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. I mean, as a Cubs fan, I'm kind of kind of into this. And, you know, obviously it's such a, a, a large and vibrant Polish community in the city. And it's, you know, if you're thinking about it from a personal level as a dad and, you know, he's got this young kid now, like, yeah, man, this is awesome. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, and it's also one of those things like, you know, sometimes where you're like, yeah, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't care if, you know, I don't care if my friend moves away or whatever. And then your friend moves away and you're like, man, this really sucks. You know, like there's a little bit of that with it. What's like, like, oh, we won't, we won't miss him if he leaves. Like, oh, we, I don't get attached to any players or anything like that. <laughs> and then when it happens, and now I saw this picture just recently of him and Fabian Herbers. And I was like, oh man, <laughs> like, <laughs> like I miss those. Yeah. You know, I miss Fabian. Like I always liked Fabian Herbers too. So, uh, you know, obviously not the, the player uh, for the union that, uh, really not he didn't really kind of live up to his potential as a union player but you know there still is it's it's definitely like a feeling of this is a move both teams really kind of needed to do mm-hmm. and it's it's you know it's gonna it is a little bit oh you know he's not gonna be on this and and, and we're gonna like yes fans will cheer for him and whatever but he scores he probably will score a goal against the union let's just let's just you know put that out there now it's gonna happen yeah. probably yeah and people are going to be like mad about it, and they should be, <laughs> especially if it was a mistake from one of the defenders that made that happen. So, uh, so yeah, it's it, it, you know kind of a mix. I think it's a mixed bag of, of you know this is a ultimately a good decision. Um, you know, not not knowing a lot of the behind the scenes and what happened, but uh, you know it. I mean, I, my hope is that it was all done in a way that was. You know, where both parties kind of felt like, okay, yeah, this this was the right thing for us to do, and there's no hard feelings or animosity between uh, 
between anybody involved in the situation. But that, that would be my hope. And, and, and by, by all accounts so far, at least in the public eye, like that's, that's kind of how things have been, have been presented. Absolutely. No, no 100%. Um, I'll say like, you know, our, like most of our guys are on the pod, you know, besides Zach, Zach had some very passionate words of Casper Spilko. But if you ask like Tim, Justin and I, like we love Casper, we really appreciate him, but we saw the bigger picture. Like we felt like we could have gotten an upgrade from Casper Spilko. We felt this after the season, right after the season ended. Um, so if we were to find a striker, um, that had more value, who was a little bit uh, better than Casper Spielko, we would have been all in on that and get some value in, in, in the same time for Casper. I would have not been mad at seeing Casper Spielko return back here. Uh, and I get it. Like, the dude just won the Golden Boot in the Champions League, right? So he feels highly, he feels that he should be uh, a gar- striker with a guaranteed contract. That's kind of why he, he wanted, you know, he was looking at other things, especially Chicago. Um, but one thing I will mention as well, this move to me kind of shows the brilliance of Ernst Tanner as far as negotiation goes. I mean, we saw him do some great sales with some of our youngsters and Mark McKenzie, Brendan Anderson last all season. This year, I mean, the fact is we got this guy for free. We got Casper for free and we made one point fifty million off of him. That is great business, gentlemen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, it, it's yeah, it's definitely- no. Go ahead, Chris, if you got something there, if you want to chime in there. No, I was gonna say, we had a little choppy. No, I was going to say, I think that's one thing fans have to understand is, you know, Ernst has this vision of, of where we need to be and where we're supposed to be. And we've been ahead of schedule, I think, for two or three years in a row. But you're right. I think the most important thing to take away from the Casper situation is that he was bought for nothing. He's going to have his name in the union record books forever. And then, and then they got a million and change for him. And all of that happened, you know, nobody saw that coming except for maybe the guys in charge. And I think that's that's the testament to say, like, okay, these guys might have an eye for what they're looking for. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, so obviously with Casper leaving, that means someone has to come in. Right. So not official yet, but from all accounts, everything points to the fact that the union have agreed to terms with Mikel Ore. A uh, a 26 year old Den- uh, Danish striker from Denmark, Bronby, um, and this. And obviously, I, I have to shine some light on my my man here, uh, Matt Ralph. If you guys haven't already, make sure you guys check out um, the bro- the brotherly game. Uh, Matt Ralph had a great article. It was an interview um, with uh, someone who knows uh, who's seen Mikel Ore uh, close and personal. And you guys definitely check this out. This is I'm showing you guys here on the screen. If you're not, if you guys are watching this live on YouTube, um, definitely check out this article here on Brotherly Game. The interview is right down here. But um, I kind of want to start this topic here uh, with you, Matt. Um, obviously, we don't have the official word from the union, but you know, obviously, JT t- put put out that tweet today. We all saw uh, 2.8 million transfer fee, 1.5 million in, in player wages yearly. Um, so the deal, I mean, that's that's pretty damn good. You know, you just sold Casper for one point uh, fifteen mil. You buy uh, Mikael for or Mikael for two point eight. So that's pretty solid business. And and all counts, everything looks like this guy's gonna be an upgrade for what we're trying to do with Casper or what from Casper, an upgrade from Casper Shabilko. So Matt, you know, kind of you know just your discussion in that interview you had and, and what you do know of Mikael Ore. Yeah, there's a there's a few things I think that that stood out to me. I don't I don't really know a whole lot about the Danish league. Uh, I know, think all of us were the same boat. <laughs> it's definitely not one of the top leagues in Europe, right? Uh, but we obviously saw, uh, you know, Mokhtar has done incredibly well uh, with Nashville, and he's really been a player that they've built their team around. I mean, they've they, they've been, um, you know, pretty outstanding as a you know their first two seasons and. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily like them, uh, but uh, you know they draw too much, and, and maybe they'll they'll you know they'll they'll continue to be that team that, that you know is, is tough to get by in, in, in the playoffs like they were this year. Uh, but you know, so I don't know a ton about that, but just just the, what I'm hearing, you know, the thing that I think that the thing that excites me is because I don't really you know is he an upgrade? I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll see, right? Um, you know, Shabilko. You know, it, 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 they're big shoes to fill. But the thing I think that's interesting about this situation is that he doesn't actually have to replace Shabilko's goals. You know, yes, they've spent a lot of money on him, but, you know, Carranza has been brought in. 
you know, presumably they'll still have Sergio Santos and Corey Burke uh, available and hopefully available more often than not. You know, this this young guy we'll talk about as well. He, maybe he'll be available for some some games um, where he's not, you know, playing with Union 2 or something. But, I, you know, I think that the, 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 the thing that's really exciting to me about it is it, it seems like he's a good fit from like a character, from a work ethic. You know, he's got young children, which he'll fit right in with a lot of the players on this team. And they're, they're kids, uh, little kids a running around. Nights. Yeah, and that's great. You know, I think there's a, there's definitely a culture that's that's developed around this team, uh, bringing in you know you know you have this mix of young dads with like young you know young men. Um, I don't like calling them kids because they're they're you know a lot of they're you know you're 18 you can you can die for your country. So um, they're they're young men, right? They're young and they're 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 they they're also like 18 going on 26. I mean, you know whatever age Jack McGlynn's birth certificate says like add five years to that. Right. So um, yeah, in terms of his development and just what he's, what he's been able to accomplish. So, you know, it's just, a, it's a, it's a cool mix that they have. And, and, and I think one of the things that they've shown in their recruiting of players is that, you know, they, they recruit a certain level of a, of a, a character and work ethic and just the way that they, they come in and, and, and you see that in the popularity of him as a player, like, yes, goal scorers are popular, Sometimes, not all the time, but just the way that the fans in uh, in Denmark talk about this guy it has me excited because he's he seems like someone who's really you know pretty humble, keeps his head down. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the guys you 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 would run into at Reading Market and not know that they play professional soccer, and that's how he's been described. I think Gazdag is that guy too. Uh, so so well, so you that, don't that, hold the same sentiment as the rest of the fan base. <laughs> What's that? You don't hold the same sentiment as the rest of the fans. Oh, I know. Well, yeah, Mario don't... Balotelli. Yeah, no, no. Don't even. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm definitely. Uh, you know, the 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 less assuming a person is, the the more I'm excited about them being on on the soccer team I, I root for. So, I uh, know there's a lot of things I think that 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 are that that appear to be positive. I mean, you know, there, there's going to be an adjustment period. Um, hopefully, uh, immigration gets their their junk together, and it's not uh, not too long of a wait to get them over here, but. Uh, we've seen, <laughs> we've seen not to you know to sort of that's an open ended thing with uh, some of these. Do you, you think know, that's Stuart why Finley last year? Stuart Finley that was a you know that was just such a difficult situation. You know he gets gets hurt while he's waiting to come over and then just never really got yeah. a chance to really to actually fight for that that position. So that's such a good um, point. So yeah, but no that, everything yeah, everything everything looks really positive so far. Do you think that's part of the delay of this announcement? The immigration. Uh, possibly, uh, you know, it, 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 all these things, uh, Chris, I mean, <laughs> it seems like they're all like sort of unique situations. Like, I, mean, I remember Dutch Cal came in, was hanging around the team, but then they couldn't announce him. Like he was trying, <laughs> I mean, and then, and then he had an ankle injury. I mean, it's just, it, there's, there's just, um, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have a lot of insight into that, but it just seems like these situations are, are very much like a case by case basis. And, you know, there's a lot of things that happen in the process of, I mean, I don't know, if you, I've moved, I've moved several times in my life, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that happens that you just That's don't true. Like, can't anticipate. That's true. I mean, hashtag unit striker watch is actually a real thing. So we got, we got to, we got to figure this out. Man. We definitely do. So announced, announced the call. <laughs> and of course our buddy, Paul, he goes on the, uh, on the, uh, it was the Sorensen, the Sorensen sign. And, and uh, he goes, uh, anyone who mentions, <laughs> Jersey are kid drops and, and uh, Mikhail Ori. They're getting a red card. I was, you know, Paul. Paul's that yeah. great, great character. Uh, Chris, uh, your thoughts, man. What do you, any thoughts? I mean, obviously, we don't know too much about Mikhail Ori besides some highlights. We don't all watch Bron B a yeah. lot, but you know, and, and just your feeling, your thoughts on uh, Mr. Mikhail Ori. Yeah, you know, my my saying if you're playing Tanner Ball and they sign a new guy, if you've ever heard of him, they spent too much money. Like, <laughs> that's it. That's the rule. Yeah. And I've never heard of them. So like it's in that ballpark. But, you know, I think about this from I mentioned the, the vision that, that Tanner obviously has for the team. And they started with these building blocks that were either they cost zero dollars or they cost very little money. You think about Kai Wagner, who cost three hundred thousand dollars. Shabilko, who we talked about, who cost zero. Right. Like these little pieces along the way. And they they reached for a couple people. So they reached for uh, Matej Orovec and they, and they missed that. And they 
they spent a little money, right? They 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 re-upped Montero, which at the time was like whatever two or three million to keep him from mess, and another fifth, one and a half to to pay him. Um, but they're sort of like building these bricks, and each successive brick is a little bit more important than the brick before it. And and so now, right? You you said we don't want the guy that got us seventeen goals last year, but we do want this guy, and we don't want this other guy from Venezuela, and we want this other guy from uh, Inter Miami, and so. No single one of those guys has to do what Casper did, but they do have to contribute more than what Casper contributed in sort of like the the goals, assists, and broader context of the team because right, they didn't really rebuild any part of their roster except the top. So like these guys now, this is it, right? It's not, is, is El Brujo going to be a good player? Is Bedoya too? No, no, no. It's these dudes at the top of the, at the two, at the four four two. So to me, it changes the whole conversation of like, we're not going to just like say the strikers don't get enough service and they're not good enough because we haven't gotten the ball. Now it's like, no, no, we're paying a ton of money for y'all. You need to score goals now, period. No more excuses. That's like totally different narrative than the union have ever had. <laughs> right? Like when did we ever Sugar say ball, it? Baby. Yeah, that's it? That's it. That, that, I think you really raise a good point because, you know, the whole like, and especially for me, when I watched the playoffs, like to me, I felt like every phase of the unions game was spot on. But when you're not getting that production up top and the fact that we went on the run that we did, you know, you get a Jakob Glesa screamer at the end. You get a, a, a great performance by Andre Blake in the shootout. And you make your goals as well. Um, and, and to me, like that, that's why I said, like, that's why we need to invest in this position. And you got two guys here, Caranza. And, and Mikel Ore, all you know, all things are pointing that those guys will get more majority of the play. Yep. But we shall see. But uh, my next question here for, on, on this point here. So, Matt, in your interview, um, I thought I heard that a lot of the times Bromby would run a four two two two, and I have heard Jim talk about before. Obviously, we've heard the three back set, but also potential possibly playing with a box in the midfield. Now. Like obviously, we all also did run the, the Christmas tree last year. Where do you see the tactics going into next season? And we'll start with you, Matt, on this one. Yeah, I mean, if you go back to what Chris said, and I think it's uh, you know not just because I like Lego, but um, the idea of building blocks is is a really good way to think about this. And and I think was it Rich Lord on on Twitter who said you know you just listen to what Aaron says because. <laughs> He basically explains everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's, he said before, I think early on what, you know, about, you know, sort of working their way up to having, you know, being able to do a bunch of different formations. Right. And I think I remember an interview that I did with Kai Wagner, certainly at, shortly after his arrival, that was one of the things he said, he's like, well, you know, it's not so much like a, it's not in Germany. It's not so much a formation. It's just that you, that you can do a lot of different things and, keep people guessing and keep in. And so we've, we've sort of seen that the progression in year two uh, season two was this, you know, they kind of stuck to more the strictly kind of, they were the, the four, four, two diamond team. And of course they had the personnel for that with Brendan and, and, and Mark was in there too, as well, of course. And, and then last year we, you know, they had to make some adjustments that were forced by, by availability of players and everything, but they were able to sort of, be a little bit less predictable because I think one of the things coming out of 2020, I mean, they benefited from the fact that the season was not complete, right? It was very incomplete and they played the same teams over and over again. But, but, you know, this, the, the second season of this, it was okay. We know what the union's going to do. And so they needed to be a little bit less predictable. And part of the problem about being less predictable is when you lose Brendan Aronson because uh, he used the, the sort of the ACE card about like, yeah. The unpredictability of that team and what was so good about the the offensive aspect of how they scored goals when Brendan was on the team. And we didn't see a lot of those goals you just watched like over and over and over and over again last season. We saw a lot of, okay, they got the goals. All right. Like let's, let, let, let's move on to this other thing that was actually more yeah. interesting in the game than yeah, the yeah. goals. Um, and so I, I, you know, you can really see, <clears throat> with, with like kind of the pieces and the building blocks of this becoming a team that, is able to do a lot more sort of different things and have different looks and have, and and one of the things that Jim has really shown as his he's grown as a coach is how much he really is like, I mean, he's great with the players, all, all that. He's great with the media. He does all those things, right? Like that, that's like, 
you know, you check those boxes off. But he's really shown his, his ability to just be like a chess master and to really. And I think one of the things that, you know, that Jim has needed more of is more chess pieces to move around on the board and to. And, and I think the development, the slow and sort of steady development, you know, I know it gets frustrating when you don't see homegrowns on the field, blah, blah, blah. But like, mm-hmm. you know, he's he's had to do what he can do with that. And the, the, the sort of the development of those players as pieces that he can he can work in and then adding not just one striker but a couple strikers and i think you're giving he's giving he's giving being given a little more to work with and that he can really sort of show his his ability to to game plan against teams and and again this this so much of this you know ernst uh, not taking anything with ernst and jim but so much of this is there's so many people in that building in Chester that are part of this, right? I mean, I mentioned Garrison Draper earlier with the performance staff earlier and keeping players healthy and all that. But then the video, the video stuff and the, the way that, you know, seeing Jose Martinez in the third day of training over watching a screen of, you know, breaking down stuff that happens. So, um, so that's, so, so that, you know, there's just a lot of elements to this. And I think like Chris said, it's building on those things. And, and, and this year is another year in that building block that they're, they're able to hopefully now take some even more expensive pieces and, yeah. and yeah. fit those in. Yeah, absolutely. Michael Thomas is checking on in from Twitter. We all love uh, Michael Thomas's takes there. So many pieces going to be tough to find the minutes for everyone. They are deep. That's kind of what they're built upon. I mean, the competition all over the pitch, the, the, uh, the depth as well as uh, from all every position, uh, it is truly remarkable as well. Um, Chris, do you anticipate them go- sticking to that four four two diamond, or you see something a little bit different this uh, this upcoming season? I-, I go back and forth between uh, the diamond is the best shape, and shape doesn't matter. I'm I'm like somewhere in the middle there. Um, you know, I, even two and three years ago, they were inverting Bedoya and Ray Gaddis on the right. Like they would let Ray Gaddis get into the corner, and Bedoya would be back in what was essentially a three man back line. Um, so I, I think about this, I think about this, like, I think Jim Curtin coaches to the, to the millimeter on that field, right? Like those guys know the same way, like a chess master, chess master doesn't actually play chess pieces. He or she plays uh, the formation essentially. Like they, they can see the board and say, okay, the next move in this board is this. And it doesn't actually matter what anything else happens. I think they coach it in that way so that they, they get their rhythm right. But um I suspect that you'll see a lot more variety this year because all the way back when, when Ernie got here, his said his goal for the team was to be too deep at every spot. And every successive year since then, I think we've said they're closer to that vision than they were the year before. But this year, for real, there's two guys at every spot who could start on MLS teams, like period. There's two guys at every position who if you held, held an MLS draft you know, a re-entry draft tomorrow, they'd get snapped up and they'd be in a starting 11. So that to me says there's probably not, like, I don't think Matt Real is going to get the minutes that he wants. I just don't, I don't think unless they sell Wagner. However, Matt Real can start in MLS. And and last time he started, you know, a couple games ago, he did a pretty nice job against Carlos Vela. So like he, he's going to be okay. Good point. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's, there's quality there. They're going to be, they can be creative if they want to. It's, it should be it should be a lot of fun, and Jim's got a lot of toys to play with, and that's the important part here as well. But um, not only are we go- getting these Mikael Ore rumors, but um, from Venezuela, we had some more <laughs> rumors coming out of there. Jose Re... Re- I'm going to sp- try my best. Do Reasco? It. Reasco? Yeah. That's, that's, my, that's just my, my attempt there. But uh, Jose has been heavily rumored to the Philadelphia Union. Um, as we know, for I don't know how Ernst got this got into to, to, or to tap into this pool, but he's been able to find some Venezuelan players here, and now he's got a center forward, 17 years old. The, when I see players that are about the age of my younger brother, who's 10 years younger than me, <laughs> it is uh, truly remarkable what's happening right now. But this uh, this is a very interesting signing if it does become official, which all things lead that it's going to be official. Um, you know, this is a kid who obviously probably going to add some depth to the striker position. He's got a lot of promise, and from what I see here, he actually signed the senior league deal 
on January 1st of this year. So it's really remarkable here. But Deportivo La Guardia um, selling him off to the Philadelphia Union. Now, guys, I mean, I, I don't expect you guys to know how a, a lot of uh, Jose, right? I don't expect you guys to know. But, you know, kind of like, you know, your thoughts on the direction, the Union heavily investing into this position. Uh, Chris, we could start with you, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, I several years ago, I said this to Jeremy on our show, and I think it still holds true because – I think Jim Curtin, you mentioned he's he's the if there's one thing he does above all else, it's he's a people person, right? He manages people really well. And I'm sure that it's not an accident that they got El Brujo and said, This is a Venezuelan guy who we sort of are gonna bring into the fold and he's gonna go. There's gotta be other Venezuelans who understand him and understand his culture who are just as talented and, and overlooked as he is, because they've done this before with Brazilian players. They've done it before with German players. They've done it before with French players where they get these little groups of two and three and four and five guys who speak the same language, who are from the same country, who can be comfortable together in this new place. And so I look at this like they proved their methodology. Uh, yeah, Thomas, is there a scout in yeah. Venezuela? There probably. There, there right? has to be, yeah. Right? Um, they proved this methodology and now that they know that they have these guys who can come here and be comfortable like if I were going to go to Venezuela and play soccer, it would help to, if I knew that there were like one or two Americans there who had done it and proven it out. And I could be like, OK, if I'm feeling like I really just need to talk to somebody in English and just like get back to my home space, I can hang out with those dudes. And I think the inverse is true. Like it must feel really comfortable if you're coming from Venezuela to the United States to have a couple other guys from Venezuela who understand what what life is like in your world. Like that, I think that's really useful. And I, I think it's part of the man management philosophy that they have at the club absolutely matt this kind of feels like a homegrown signing from if i'm being honest <laughs> with you <laughs> it's a big big net and, and i do worry a little bit because like i said he got just he literally just signed on to the senior team at la guardia and now he's getting sold making he's getting another he's getting sold again you know what what uh what are your kind of your thoughts on on uh this type of move here for the union yeah i mean he technically can't move till he's 18 which is on the second i guess so i don't know if that's that's because I, th I think you could announce something and it just doesn't become official until he turns 18 but uh, you know they did announce anton Sorensen on finally on his birthday so maybe they're waiting for his 18th birthday to to announce it uh but you know it's interesting i think you know the union two situation has been you know you know a weird situation uh to say the least you know they had a season where they were playing games and they let media in for games that weren't against MLS teams. And, you know, so far they haven't really, I mean, there's still no schedule for next pro, you know, there's still, you know, there's some stuff coming out from the athletic reporting. There's some things I've heard from different sources, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a weird situation. It's, it's not, um, I think where I'm at with it is I think the union are good, but, the part that they can't control is everybody else. So, uh, the, the, and that's going to, that's going to determine how good of a league it is, is all the other teams. And we've seen how poorly a lot of the other teams have done all of these things that the union, you know, they're good at certainly, but they get even more credit for being good in part because of how bad some of these other teams are. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think, you know, they have, they have kind of established this model with their, with their second team. Uh, you know, when they still like, you know, the last couple of years, you know, before the, the season where they kind of played friendlies, but, you know, of, of bringing in players from South America, young, unproven players who are in that kind of 18 to 20 range that they can, you know, maybe, maybe find some value on, they loan them in, they send them back if they don't work out kind of thing. And so, you know, that's been, that's been a strategy that hasn't really produced a, you know, you know, a, hasn't necessarily produced. I mean, Baizo did sort of come in that way and, and Galena came in and played for the first team, but didn't play, uh, if you know, if you remember, um, and you know, the, the IU thing was kind of that, like, you know, trying to find these, these sort of gems and that, you know, the 18 to 20 range from places that, you know, are sort of out of the way. And I think spending money on one of those, like the, it sounds like they're doing with this, this Jose, um, maybe as a as a as a new uh, a new tact in that direction, um, and it is you know the the academy has not produced a top striking talent, but very few academies have other than FC Dallas, <laughs> uh, maybe Toronto at this point. So 
um, you know, that that's a position of need and it's a position of need all over the world. So if they can, you know, they can invest a little bit of money, find some of these players, bring them in. And, you know, the, the Davos situation, they took a flyer on, it didn't work out, but you know, they didn't really put a whole lot of money in there. And I think they probably got a lot of that subsidized by the league anyway. So, mm. um, you know, I think it's, I think it's, a, I think it's a good, you know, if you look at it as like, they have like multiple fronts, you know, they have this Academy and they're always, I mean, Jim is constantly recruiting when, and every time he talks about trying to get young people to, <laughs> from other parts of the country to, to consider the union from players around, just trying to kind of be, have the union be sort of this, this factory that, that brings in players, you know, not just from Philly, but from around the country and then from uh, as teenagers, but then obviously unless they have a U.S. passport, they can't come in until 18. So, you know, to sort of have some of those players come in through that, through that doorway too. So um, I think it's, I think it's a good move. Um, I don't know anything about them. And again, I, I would be a little concerned about like, okay, what is he going to get meaningful minutes in this new competitive platform? And I, I, I don't know. At this yeah, point. No, I'll, no one really knows. We don't know even right, what it's going to be. Right. So. I'll have to dive into my Venezuelan pool again, see if I get some information <laughs> on Jose, but uh now nah, it's. Uh, did, I thought I saw you. Did you report? Didn't we get a pair of siblings from Venezuela, the Zambrano brothers? To they're, from, they're from Ecuador. Ecuador. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, but I mean, even a whole entire South America, they they except for Colombia for some reason they they don't want to go back to Colombia ever since the Valley. Yeah, and the, and the Zambrano brothers, you know, they're 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 young, but there's a. I think their dad was born in New York, so there's okay. Yeah, okay. again, you need to have some kind of. Uh, you, know, you can't just bring in fifteen year olds from from another country that is pretty true okay that makes sense then uh uni 2 is going to have some interesting stories to follow this year that's thomas checking in as well i'm, I'm excited to have uni 2 back uh marlon blank is is uh running the, sh- the ship over there right yes he is yep. love love what he's doing man absolutely love love what he's doing but uh speaking of which um not only do we have jose uh coming in here but the union also signed in from our own backyard uh anton Sorensen. this has you know obviously been something that we've kind of been anticipating for a while now, but it's very interesting, gentlemen, because of what we kind of discussed a little bit earlier. You know, the Kai Wagner rumors earlier. Um, will he be going in the near future? And then, of course, we got Matt Rial back, but then you got this young kid who is a natural left back, from my understanding. So, you know, we don't have to shift over Nathan Harrell like the Eastern Conference Finals over to the left back position. So that'd be great to see. Um, Matt, I mean, I, I know, man, you, you love to keep an eye out on, on those those uh, on the youth academy. Uh, what what can you really tell us about Anton Sorensen coming up here with the with the uh, first team? Yeah, so he he came in. He's from Ann Arbor. He was born in Haiti, actually, and he was recruited to play initially on the U seventeen team, and then uh, you know came in the same time as Jack McGlynn, I believe, and a couple others. And uh, you know he you know, again like this past year has been kind of. I mean, I've seen him play here and there. I've seen him train with the first team, and it's hard to really kind of uh, evaluate a player from that perspective obviously has a lot of the tools of you know and there's the film that we do have on them from from games are you know it's pretty exciting uh some of the some of the stuff he's done he was doing you know he was playing with Jack McGlynn and Paxton Aronson and Nathan with with Union 2 and USL Championship two years ago and he was arguably I mean he was right there with them in terms of you know, if you look, I mean, I, I said at the time and, you know, that he was the, the only player on the field that should be a pro that wasn't at the, you know, after, mm-hmm. after, you know, Paxson and Jack and Quinn and Brandon, you know, signed their, signed their contracts and joined the first team. So, so it, it, a, a lot of promise. I mean, outside back. So, you know, you know, and even with Nathan, I mean, Nathan's, you know, Nathan's, uh, you, know, um, you know, he'll be 21 this season, you know, but, you know, they're not, um, you know, you can't, you, I, I guess, and, and Chris can talk about this as a defender, I, the, 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 you know, and, and even with Matt Real, you know, he's still only 22, which for a left back is not, you know, ancient, I right? So, um, I know, it's crazy. It's really crazy. So, you know, it, there's, and, and part of the thing with the union is they they ask a lot of their outside backs. And, yeah. You know the you know a lot of times like you you'll see all of the things you want to see going forward, but not the things going back. Or you'll see all the things defensively that you want to see in, a, in an outside back, but not the things going forward. I mean, Ray Gattis, right? That's the story of his yeah. career. But 
you know, so there, it's it's hard, a little harder to predict, and obviously not knowing. Does it seems like Kai Wagner is staying at least till the summer at this point? But yeah, you know, uh, we're almost on the deadline, I guess. So, uh, you know, it's if you know, Bizo's African Cup of Nations hasn't worked out. So, you know, I thought maybe if he had had a breakout tournament like the guy who's been playing over him has, <laughs> uh, I think their right back has been excellent. Uh, unfortunately for 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 Olivier, but you know that maybe he would have been someone that that, that could have got generated some offers on the, the transfer market as well. So. Um, it's, 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 yeah, definitely the, 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 he's 19, uh, he's right on schedule in terms of where he needs to be at this point as a, as a left back. And, you know, I think, you know, you just sort of treat him like you did Nathan Harrell this past year, wanting, wanting him to play, but knowing, you know, he might not get any minutes unless, you know, half the team gets COVID. But, uh, <laughs> oh my God. Don't, don't remind this fan base, man. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> oh man sorry oh, sorry oh, if man. you don't if you can't laugh about it now I mean, come on <laughs> i love it i love it oh, it's so ridi- i mean it's it's just it's so ridiculous like yeah remember some twitter account with like three followers tweets it out and i like there's no way and then it uh, turns out to be true and you're like no what the heck like what we like, we heard of, real. we heard about it tuesday and we were asked very nicely not to say anything uh, and we didn't because, you know, we only got a couple folks that we can talk to down there and uh, the trust is really important. But I remember thinking Tuesday morning, I need to scream this from a mountaintop because there's a lot of people who are going to be super. And and oh, yeah. we did it. Uh, but, man, that was a rough week. That well, was and a then, rough yeah. Week. And then I had like, yeah. And then even leading up to it, it's like, you know, I, so, someone told me like, yes, they're absolutely. I'm like, there's no chance they can play. No, there's no chance they can play. I'm like. Are you sure there's no chance? <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I never I didn't say anything because I'm like, I'm just not even touching this, right? It's oh, like man. we'll just go with what the official reporting is. But um, you know, because uh, yeah, I, I wasn't about to yeah, it's like this he's like, no, hundred percent they're not playing. I'm like, are you sure? Like I, I kept texting that, are you sure? Are you hundred percent? He's like, Yes, hundred percent they're not playing. I'm like, you've got to oh, be kidding man. me. <laughs> I think what's the biggest what ifs, man. It is a big what if. And I think what's wild about that is like from today, sitting from today, which is, you know, January 26th, it's really easy to be like, oh, yeah, it was Omicron and everybody catches Omicron. It doesn't matter what you do. Like you're going to catch it, even if you sit in your room by yourself. But that was like (laughs) one week before Omicron was a thing. And so the fact that everybody caught it, but was vaccinated and doing all their smart things, that wasn't part of the lexicon yet. And so it didn't make any sense, right? It didn't make any sense that everybody caught it. And, oh, uh, man, yeah. Yeah, man. I think all of South Jersey got the, the following week, right, Johnny? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I I, I mean, I got it. So uh, it's it's <laughs> it definitely caught, caught around it's here like for sure. like everybody has. Like, everyone's yeah. Yeah. got Omicron. Yeah. That was, that was a rough two days for sure. Um, Chris, um, Mike asked a really interesting question I wanted to throw to you, man. Um, if Wagner goes at some point mm. this year, who has priority at left back? Would you give it to Sorensen, Reed, or Leon Flock? You know, um, I think the union ask more of their outside backs than they do of any other position on the team, other than maybe if they're playing in a Christmas tree with a single striker, what they ask of their strikers. But um, I think there's so, so, so much irony in the fact that this academy has produced two left backs now and neither of them can see the field because they, they got some dude from the German third division instead. <laughs> um, but I think it's because they ask so much of those outside yeah. backs. Like you need to be, as Matt said, you need to be the best defender on the field and arguably among the best attackers on the field too, because your service is as crucial as anybody else's. Um, so I think Wagner's a commodity. I think there's no chance he stays for more than another year. And honestly, I'm shocked he hasn't gone yet. Um, but who has priority? I think it's probably Real. Um, I, I could see them putting Flock there, but he Flock has said more than a couple times he really likes being at the six. And so if you shift that diamond to that box like that, you could put Flock and um, El Brujo next to each other. Mm. They would be a little redundant because I, I don't I think El Brujo offers a little bit a lot more going forward than Flock does, but like not the same thing going forward that you would necessarily want from an attacking midfielder. But um that would give you a ton of freedom to get those backs up the field. Cause now you'd have four guys sitting in this box beneath them. Um, so yeah, I think it would, I think it would be Ray Allen. I think you'd put flock in the midfield 
anywhere because he's kind of a utility knife in that sense. Yep. And frankly, you know, we listed out a bunch of the Ernst Tanner findings of uh, uh, players that he's found along the way. We didn't mention Flock's name. The fact that this dude came essentially from, again, no one had ever heard of him. And all of a sudden, like he's in the conversation for, should this guy be starting in the world cup cycle for the U S national team? Like he might be the best number six on the team. That's not named Tyler Adams. So, you know, Ooh. right. Like, I, I don't know. James Sands is cool, but is he right? So I don't know. I, I think I like it's probably that. real. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I, I I agree. And and to your point, man, that's they do a lot. I remember watching. I didn't realize this this season. I was just watching the game at at the Sioux, and I saw Kai Wagner taking a corner kick from the right corner. Mm-hmm. That means he's got to run all the way to the other side <laughs> and up just to get back on defense. Yeah. Like that's it's a lot. That's a lot of running, man. That's a lot of running. Yeah, uh-huh. no, yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned that, Johnny, because I think you know one of the things I do like about the box, and 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 I did I did like it when they used it a lot at Union too, and maybe that's why I feel the way I do about it as it relates to Jack McGlynn. Uh, But you know, if you lose Kai Wagner, I think it increases your need to have Jack McGlynn on the field because mm. of his ability with the ball on set pieces and dead balls. So um, you know, it does it does you know, and I'm. I would much rather see Jack McGlynn in the final third than 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 Leon Flock. I'd much rather see Leon Flock in the the defensive third than 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 McGlynn. So I think the box does, you know, it does accomplish that in the sense that you know it gives it give theoretically it gives McGlynn a little more comfort. And more, it's a little more in McGlynn's comfort level in terms of you know that he would have Flock behind him in that in that setup and then you know he can with those overlapping runs from the left back he can he can go to work so and then if whoever he has in front of him if it's paxton if it's yeah god's dog or or, um you know if montero is still with the team so you know i think i you know from that uh (laughs) do you think speaking of which i I mean i don't know i I wonder how the visas are going for his family right i think he can't leave now like it's there's that that was no way he leaves now so wait the story on that was First, it was the it was the family thing, and then it was a locker room dust up, and then it was sort of both a family thing and a locker room dust up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so any potential maybe a summer leave exit from Philly? He's I, another I one I thought Afcon could have raised his stock, but I mean he wasn't bad, but he was uh, he didn't. I he mean Cape Verde just anybody. didn't didn't produce. There just wasn't enough going forward to. And he's playing sort of on that wing. I, I, you know, he's not really. really? I don't know. Yeah, it's he was. Just, yeah, he See, did I, play the 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 game. Actually, the game that he didn't do much of anything was the game he played centrally. So, uh, you know, I think he did do some things on the wing and um, created some chances. But just as a as a uh, offensively, they the Blue Sharks were not. Um, you know, no one no one was singing. Yeah, you know, I enjoyed watching them. I mean, I I love that Irish uh, center back they have them there, but uh, you know, I enjoyed watching Montero play. But uh, you know, I thought he had a chance if you know if they he had done some, you know, a little more you know, dazzling sort of things that he's capable of, like you know, CCL that CCL game that he played out of his mind. Yeah. Um, you know that maybe that would have you know, been a little bit of a shop window, but I don't know at this point. I mean, you just. That, and that's where, you know, some of this optimism, like I'm on board, but also I'm like, well, you know, the way that, the way that things can kind of, I mean, this past year, I think was, was taught us a lot as a fan base and as people covering this team of how just so many unpredictable things could happen. I mean, the whole Montero thing was just weird. I mean, I think the COVID thing kind of like glossed over everything else that happened the entire season, but that was weird. And yeah, there but, was just some strange things that happened within the the team. I, I'm I'm trying to put like the personal spin on this because I always think about it like, what does it feel to be Jamiro Montero? Like, what must that life feel like? And so I try and give him a pass because if we're talking about the building blocks, like he's the biggest block. There's no bigger block than Miro until Mike Mikalura gets here or or whatever. Uh and if if his if his understanding was I'm just not coming off the field, and then you took him off the field in a game the Union were playing like garbage, they were yes. playing terribly. I could see him being like, "Do we do we not understand each other? I'm Jamiro Montero. I'm the guy who stays on the field." But I also see that from the context of like, I'm Jamiro Montero in the United States during COVID, and I can't see my family, 
And I don't want to be in Miami because this is the most Miami is the most boring soccer franchise in the whole world. I don't want to be here right now. And I definitely don't want to get it subbed off the field right now, Jim. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about, dude? Leave me alone. I can I can understand all of that. That yeah. all makes sense yeah. to me. Yeah. I, I see. I love Jamiro. Um, and a lot of people make the argument that he can't play the number 10. I think he could play the 10. I think he could play the eight. The issue I run with Jamiro is when he starts, you know, acting like Ronaldinho in the midfield, he's doing these elasticos and everything. And, and like, instead of one just touch, dude, one touch, just ping it. <laughs> yes, exactly. That That's pretty much Sorry. it. Uh, real quick one. Though, has anything good ever happened for the Philadelphia Union in Florida? Like has any, any, they won the Sun Coast. Don't I, you no, dare. No, not, pre- not preseason. No, <laughs> don't you I mean, dare. Although preseason, that was when El Cino got that. Uh, he El got a red, got, first red card first game against Red Bulls. That was, El Cino <laughs> got hurt in that Orlando game, and that was the game that Fafa got in a fight. Fafa got, Fafa fight. got suspended yeah. for four games to start the season. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, I can't just, believe. I can't this, believe. The, 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 Miro got hurt in Florida, right? Wasn't that against Orlando City? Yeah. Oh, my God. Remember that yeah. slide tackle? That's a question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a question. Dirty. Uh, it just seems, you know, and I'm, MLS back had a lot of good things. They they didn't win the whole thing like they should have. But yeah. it just seems like I don't know. Florida is this. Does anything good happen in Florida? <laughs> like not you specific, just like broadly. Well, I'll say this: at least the union didn't lose to the Tampa Bay Mutiny, right? So there, there you, there you go. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's true. Um, Mike's had another great question. If we assume a four-man uh, midfield, I'm curious who the odd man out ends up being. And oh, man. you know, when you guys were talking about that box, I couldn't help but think, like, where does Ali fit in that whole box type of circumstance? Obviously, the kids are out, right? this is the question, right? Like when, when I was talking about too deep earlier, it's not even too deep. There's just like 10 dudes who could be on the field. Um, I think, and I, <laughs> I hate when people say, I've been saying they should do this for years. I think Bedoya should be a right back this year. I think this is the time. I this is the it. place. Uh, no, I think it's a great question. Who's the odd man out? It's the young guys. You're right. You're right. It's the young guys. I would say it's, it's the, it's one of well, I think you still work in one of them, and it's it's some sort of rotation. Yeah. Um, again, like I said, I I think the the box is maybe the thing you do when when you when you need to get Jack McGlynn in and get in minutes, right? Um, and, and I think Bedoy, yeah, it's it's interesting because, I mean, that's another player that people are very very passionately divided about and uh, you know i i you know my you, won't, you won't hear me say anything <laughs> slanderous about Bedoya ever um the guy the, he's guess, the dude he's he's, the he's dude. just you know he's uh, the captain <laughs> let's put it this way if i was a tats guy there'd be a couple tat there'd be a, a nice tattoo of alejandro Bedoya. <laughs> Like his, it'll be Yo, his face in the huddle. Like that would be it, right on my time back. for you to be a tax guy, man. You got plenty of time. Yes, plenty of time. We definitely need to. Get I that honestly goal. think Bedoya is my um, he's my number one for most successful post career of any player in Philadelphia Union history. I'm you calling think so? that now. I think he's gonna just. Yeah, he's Sen- got Senator he, Senator Bedoya from Pennsylvania. I don't, uh, something, man. I, whatever it is that he decides, like he's just gonna he's gonna kill it. Like he just. Um, I think what's interesting what's interesting about him is he feels like he's from South Philly. Like he just feels <laughs> like yo, he's from South Philly. He says hoagie, he says wawa, he says water. Like he just feels like that. So it makes sense that he would be he would be the guy. He's hanging out on Passion. <laughs> he's going over to Joanne's house later. <laughs> wow. Funny story. Quick funny story. When I was living in Philly, um, I was going to Acme North in uh, Acme, sorry, in Northern Acme. Liberty. I was gonna say I'm from South Philly right now. It, it is definitely Acme. <laughs> yeah, it's the right, Acme. Yeah. Um, and I'm going through the Northern, Northern Liberties neighborhood, and who do I see uh, as I'm driving by? Ali Bedoya with his wife just walking. I was like, I, I slowed down for a second. I was like, Oh, Ali and Capitano, and he was like, Oh, what's up? And I didn't want to creep him out too much, so I just drove <laughs> off. But that's the beauty of having these union players in the in the city, man. I did want to say I was out one night. Uh, this is like two or three years ago. You mentioned Fafa being a nice dude and the, the fact that he got like a three game suspension for some insane slur or something like that. I was at uh, Gran Cafe L'Aquila, the Italian oh, place. Oh, he loves it there, man. He loves it there. So I'm there. Oh, I run into Aurelian Collin and um, what was our German striker? Uh, number seven, the guy who was here for two years. Oh, Andrew Vooten. Vooten. So it's Vooten and Vooten. Collin sitting in the booth. 
and I was all dressed up for work and I just came over and I was like, Hey guys, like, I just want to say, I appreciate you or whatever. And they were like, Oh, great to see you. You were, you got a nice suit. And I was like, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but then I walked back to the bathroom and Fafa's there talking to the kitchen staff and the bus boys in Italian. And I was like, okay, this is, this is my guy. Yeah, this is good. He gets it. He gets yeah. it. That's, that's, that's why I miss Fafa. I still miss Fafa. Yeah. Since, I, since, we're, since we're on the topic of Chris's fashion, I just have to say, Yo, that Chris, Chris, Chris tight rolled his pants on '90s night, <laughs> and he was he was in the press box. I, I noticed it in the <laughs> locker room. I was like, "Dude, you tight rolled your pants. That's amazing." <laughs> They're tight rolled right now. This is not That's '90s. Awesome. Night. It's just right now. <laughs> no, I know, and I, I'm, not, I'm just saying, like, it was like the most perfect thing. Like, whether you planned it that way or not, I was just like, "This is amazing." Well, when we meet up for uh, our yearly front office functions, uh, Chris's suits definitely oh. are always on point. When he, I'm, I'm assuming you're coming straight from work, so I am. Yeah, you got the suit going on. It's it looks good. It's like Chris is ready to interview for a front office job. That's should. right. <laughs> yeah, I heard Chris Albright is gone. I'm I'm yeah. here to take over. Yeah, there you That's go. It. It would be a, you know a, it'd be a funny a funny comedy movie where a guy who just looks the part gets the job and. Yeah, this yeah. would be set in the in 1980s. Of That's trading American spaces, soccer. basically, right? Yeah, That's we'll it. make we'll make a Moneyball parody, and we'll, we'll, we'll while Chris is the, as the star. There you go. Gosh, there's so many. There's so many. Uh, there's so much potential for 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 screenplays that uh, related to the soccer team that we we all follow. It's it's great, man. It's great. Not they, not saying they'd be good, but there's this 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 a lot of material, a lot of potential. I think it'd be good. At least inspire ideas. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, guys, that's going to do it for another episode of Duke by the River. That hour went by way too quickly. Before we sign off, though, um, guys, real quick, want to start off. Where can people find you, Chris? Start, uh, start off, man, on Twitter. And obviously, you know, whatever uh, all three points are, you know, got going on in the future as well, man. Yeah, yeah. So you can find us on Twitter at all three points. Uh, you can find our podcast, the All Three Points podcast, at phillysoccerpage.net, where I'm a writer and also associate editor. So appreciate being here. Appreciate anybody who's following along and go Union. Amen. Amen. What about you, Matt? Brotherlygame.com. And I'm on Twitter way too much at Matt Ralph way. underscore TBG. Way. And yeah, no, this is this is great. And uh, I also want to give a give a shout out to, to Chris for his 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 jersey um, jersey evaluating skills. He's really he's really good at that as well. I, if Thanks, I man. if I ever am conflicted about how I feel about something, I just I just I just message Chris of like, "What do you think of this?" Yeah, not to attention to detail, man. That's why we love you, Chris. Appreciate it, that, well, guys. Cuz he, he's that. like you'll give a good reaction to it even though if I'm like or if I think you'll like it but I'm not sure like, "What do you think of this one?" And uh, <laughs> and you'll say, "Well, actually, it's it's very derivative of uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think you did that one too one time you're like, "Yeah, that really reminds me of like something super obscure." I was like, "Holy crap." <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> yeah well awesome. i appreciate that that's good that's good yeah. <laughs> awesome stuff guys awesome stuff all right ladies and gentlemen that's gonna do it make sure you guys hit that like button subscribe to that part of philly youtube channel as we always broadcast these dupe by the rivers lives on here and this will be rebroadcasted on psn radio following this live recording and you can find that wherever you stream podcasts and you can find all of your favorite philly sports on our podcast on psn radio as well Ladies and gentlemen, that is Chris, Mr. All Three Points. That is Matt Ralph from the Brotherly Game. Of course, I go by the name of Ed Parcero Philly, and we are telling you guys to do ball. Talk to you guys next week.